views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Hello and welcome to a special edition of OpenBXRX, BronxNet's special coverage providing you the latest information that matters to you during COVID-19, the coronavirus. I'm your host, Sanji Lopez, and today is Tuesday, April 14th. On today's show, we'll be joined by several organizations and community members who are supporting the Bronx during these trying times. Coming up, quarantine can be a cause for concern for individuals who are home with an abusive partner, but support and services are available remotely. We'll speak to the Violence Intervention Program VIP Mujeres to find out more. Then, immigration offices may be closed, but CUNY Citizenship Now continues to offer free professional remote immigration services online and by phone. Stay tuned to find out how you can get access to these resources. After that, the Kingsbridge Armory is a 180,000 square foot space. The North Bronx Collective has ideas and demands urging that the space be used for much needed COVID-19 relief. We'll find out more about their petition later on. And funerals during COVID-19. What are the changes in rules and regulations when it comes to mourning loved ones during a pandemic? We'll speak to a spokesperson from the National Funeral Directors Association to keep you informed. So please stay tuned. Open BXRX starts now. Welcome to OpenBXRX on BronxNet. I'm your host, Sanji Lopez, inviting you to get social with us at BronxNet TV on Instagram and Twitter and BronxNet Community Television on Facebook. Also, if you're watching us on cable, you can continue to stay up to date with our on-screen social media feeds, providing you the latest COVID-19 and community updates and important headlines. As we all know, most of New York is on pause and quarantined. And for abused women and individuals, this presents a danger of its own. Many advocates against domestic violence have increased concerns due to isolation. And for over 30 years, the Violence Intervention Program, VIP Mujeres, has been a community-based nonprofit organization dedicated to eradicating domestic and intimate partner violence. And their hotline continues to be open for those in need, even during this pandemic. We're joined by Carla Mejia, Violence Intervention Organizer at VIP Mujeres. Thank you for joining us virtually, Carla. Can we just start off with learning about VIP Mujeres and the services offered there? As you mentioned, Violence Intervention Program has been around for over 30 years. Um, it was created uh, in a grassroots effort to support survivors of domestic and sexual abuse, and it began in East Harlem. Um, we we do a lot of focusing in the Latino, Latina, Latinx community um, to provide like culturally specific services. Um, we have two residential programs uh, and we have three non-residential. That includes our emergency shelters. Uh, it includes our 24 seven hotline, our economic justice program and our community and outreach, our communications and outreach department. Um, so I'm the community organizer there. I've been there for a while, but I was, you know, raised in the Bronx. So, you know, um, I'm very much, very much part of, of, of the community that we're talking about today. And Carla, can we speak about the heightened dangers for domestic abuse at the time while people are in quarantine? There have been a surge of domestic violence incidents. Right. Uh, so like you mentioned, there are, we are in a moment of, high elevated crisis. And we already know that during these times, the violence and the tension at home uh, amplified. That is due to unemployment, that is due to just the nature of the pandemic, correct? Um, but I think more so for our, the survivors and victims with the state at, um, at home orders by the city and you know by the governor, um, it makes it so that survivors cannot just like walk away. Um, they're quarantined, they're stuck with an abusive partner. Um, and so obviously that's, that, that just makes it that much more dangerous for our, for our, our members of the community. Um, 
so you know we we have some advice for for those that are currently quarantined with an abuser um and it very importantly is you know try to reach out to someone who you trust talk to them about the possibility of what it would look like if they you need to flee so where are the documents of your child all the documents that you consider to be important um your safety bag um tell them about what's going on um talk about you know if they could babysit for you um because again like it's not it's also the children who are also at home now so the children are also exposed to maybe possibly being abused or at minimum witnessing these high levels of abuse and Carla, can we share um, the hotline and what um, an individual can expect when they call that hotline? Yeah, thank you. So Violence Intervention Program has a 24-7 bilingual hotline. Um, and when an individual calls, they're going to be, um, they're going to be connected to a, a professionally trained uh, crisis counselor, right? Um, they're going to be expected to be treated with respect, dignity, and compassion. Um, and they're also going to um, be supported with language. So if a person doesn't just speak Spanish or English, we do have other um, interpretation services to communicate with them. Um, they're going to be, you know, expected to talk about what is going on, but not necessarily in an invasive way because everything will be confidential at all times. Um, and we'll provide them services according to what they need. May we also have the hotline number, Carla, just so we can outline it here at the top of the show for anyone who is seeking um, assistance at this time. 1-800-664-5880. And I do want to add that um, this highline is accessible not just to a person that is experiencing direct violence, but it's also accessible to anybody who is concerned for a loved one, um, someone in community. If there's a neighbor and you're concerned for them, you you could also reach out in the hotline and talk about what are some of the ways that you could support that individual. Right. And speaking of that, I mean, um, I see a lot of advertising by VIP when it comes to the importance of social solidarity. And that's what kind of you mentioned just now, like, you know, being there for your neighbor and being there for the community. Can you just tell me about the importance of that at this time? Mm -hmm. So in, in, in concept, the, the idea of social solidarity is understanding that we're all interconnected that especially more so you know reflecting on what's going on we realize that the health and the well-being of the individual is connected to the whole of the community in practice what that looks like is that if you are someone who carries more privilege than another individual you find ways to support them for example, if you had a, a nanny or you had a domestic worker and you were providing, you know, that you were using their services and at this moment um, there's, you know, you might be quarantined, continue to pay them. Continue to pay them at least half of what you were paying them or, you know, at minimum, continue to provide them with that financial support, right? Um, if you have someone who you know is going through it right now, offer practical support, offer to babysit, offer to go pick up some grocery stores, offer to send them resources, maybe calling them, you know, checking up on them, just really um, checking in for your neighbor at this point, right? Um, and believe in them believe the person that is telling you that they're going through something very severe and very traumatic at this moment. And can you also tell us, Bella, um, just reassure um, viewers who are listening and might be, um, you know, needing this help right now, there's also always help for low income and POC survivors. So like, you know, it's important to also highlight the people of color who are um, going through things and low income survivors as well. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, part of and, and one of the key points right now for social solidarity is um, knowing that at this moment, not all of our community members are treated the same and not everyone is receiving government relief funds, right? Our immigrant community right now is left out. And so, you know, part of it is donating to emergency funds. Violence intervention right now was not able to have our annual fundraiser, which allows us a lot of space to do as we, as, as we see needed with those funds. So we are urging people that if they have the ability to support or um, to go to our website, Violence Intervention Program, 
www.ghostbusters.org and um, try to donate whatever it is that you can. And if it's not us, try to donate to any other organization that you trust and that you um, that you, you you support, right? Maybe even in a grassroots level, that's also very much needed at this point. And 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 understand that those 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 funds are going to go to providing support in every way, right? Um, we do have crisis counseling right now happening. You know, we're still working remotely. We're providing over a hundred counseling sessions um, per week. And, you know, that has been transferred through telecommunications um, and telephones, but we're still here and we're still listening to any of the concerns that are happening. Um, our 24-7 online uh, hotline is open and we also have a chat service in our website. So maybe you might not be able to have the freedom to just pick up the phone and call, but you do have the, the ability to go to our hotline. I mean, excuse me, our website and, and, and chat through them. Um, again, our emergency um, shelters are still open. We're taking intakes right now. If you need to, if you need to leave, um, call us and we'll put you in, in in services that could get you into houses in the safer in a safer environment um and and you're going to be welcomed with open arms we're still here we're still providing support we're not going anywhere thank you for that and thank you to Rebbe Mujeres for you know continuing this movement even despite um lack of you know being together at this time you're still in solidarity and still providing this assistance to those who need it the most um before we go carla can you also talk to us about the lack of movement and what comes next for survivors yeah. i mean i know vip is still working on the forefront but there has been there hasn't been a lot about this um going around a lot of this work hasn't been done can you tell me about mm -hmm. that um yeah before i go into the lack of i want to talk about what is being done right because even 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 in it before COVID 19 our communities were mobilizing our communities were enduring high levels of trauma and they've just taken it to another another on another level on another side right so even now we're seeing for example on the community organizing side that the members are still mobilizing we're reaching out to people who are currently quarantined with other with abusive partners they're reaching out um, we're still trying to provide like actual on the ground uh, community outreach so people know where the hotline is. We know that we're receiving, um, even though we might not be receiving the high volumes of calls, we know that's due to the fact that they're quarantined and might not be able to call, but the abuse is still happening. Um, I see community members who are delivering foods to other, to other sick members in our community. I've seen our community put, you know, chat groups and share resources and emotionally support each other. But yes, there is a huge, uh, or not, I don't know if the word huge would be the best word to use, but there is a lack of, you know, there was a lack of planning um, for what was to come during the quarantine stay, in, stay at home order, right? Where were these uh, uh, members of our community gonna go? So we have to keep in mind that we always have to be prepared because our communities are always enduring high volumes of trauma and marginalized communities had to endure this for many years and are not receiving any of these like government refund uh, resources at the moment. Thank you again, Carla, for your time and thank you to VIP Mujeres for your service and working diligently and remotely to provide these help, this help and resources to those who need it. And thank you, Sanji, for, you know, always reaching out and checking in on us. Um, every 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 media platform at this moment is extremely important for our members to receive the services they need. So once again, thank you for having us. Happy to work with you. If you or anyone you know is experiencing abuse, please call the Violence Intervention Program hotline at 800-664-5880. Again, that's 800-664-5880. Also, visit VIPMujeres.org for more information and to find out how to donate to survivors. VXRX will be right back. Right to Council NYC Coalition held a virtual tenant town hall, inviting the community to discuss rent cancellations and other tenant questions and concerns during COVID-19. The Right to Council is basically a citywide tenant organizing coalition that fought for and won um, low income New York, for low income New Yorkers to have the right to a lawyer should they face an eviction. Right. And it's not just about ensuring that tenants have attorneys, but also about building tenant power. 
um, and about fighting to reclaiming our home. Along with Housing Justice for All, Right to Counsel won a historic eviction moratorium for all tenants in New York State, meaning no one living in the state can be evicted until at least June 20th. We put pressure on both the mayor and the governor, and it worked. Less than one week later, we won an eviction moratorium. Landlords can't sue you um, while this moratorium is in effect. It means that housing courts in New York are closed except for emergency repairs and illegal lockouts. And it means that there are no evictions, period, until at least June 20th. They're now organizing a campaign to urge Governor Cuomo to hashtag cancel rent. The demands also call for rent freezings and ask for the investment of $10 billion in homes to house the homeless. He has the power and we are demanding that he cancel rent. What does that mean? It means rent, mortgages and utility payments um, that are owed or accumulating accumulated during the length of this crisis should just be canceled. If you missed the live town hall, you can check out a recap on Right to Council's Facebook page. To see the petition and call to actions for these movements, visit righttocouncilnyc.org. Reporting for BronxNet, Sanji Lopez. Welcome back to OpenBXRX. The COVID-19 pandemic has raised many immigration concerns from travel bans and advisories to embassy, consulate, United States citizenship, and immigration service office closures. However, help is still available remotely for those with immigration concerns. CUNY Citizenship Now has been providing free, high-quality, confidential citizenship and immigration law services to help immigrants on their path to U.S. citizenship since 1997. Joining us now to tell us more is Stephanie D. Delia, Managing Attorney of City Council Services at CUNY Citizenship Now. Welcome, Stephanie. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Just to start off, can we just learn about CUNY Citizenship Now? Absolutely. So um, Citizenship Now is one of the largest per se university based legal assistance programs. Um, as, you, as you mentioned, we have um, been in existence since 1997. We have six full time centers and by full cent by full time centers, I mean, these are um, immigration offices that are based in CUNY um, campuses. We have one in York, for example, one in Medgar Evers, and there's four others scattered throughout the five boroughs. Those offices are open five days a week, Monday to Friday, um, approximately nine to five. In addition to that, we also have the program that I manage, which is the City Council um, Services Program. We are in approximately 40 council member offices we refer to those as our part-time locations. We provide services out of those locations roughly about once, twice, or three times a week, depending on the need in that particular community. Um, we assist approximately 1,500 people a year. The number fluctuates depending on um, what is going on in the immigration world. We do one-on-one -on -one services. So one legal service provider actually goes to the location that person is the same one who's going to go every single week. Um, and that person basically assists with providing consultations and application assistance. The people who come to us for services are seeing the same people every time they return to the offices. Um, in addition to all of that, we also do large group immigration application assistance. The most popular one we do is citizenship applications. During the COVID-19 pandemic, we have had to halt those. We cannot wait to start those again. But when those were being done, we used to do those twice a month. Um, I apologize. Let me take a step back. Every single service I've mentioned have been halted. So the full-time centers are currently closed for in-person services. Um, and the city council member program is not providing in-person services. However, those two programs are doing remote services right now. Um, the large application assistance services, we've just completely stopped. We're not doing those remotely. Um, we are considering or thinking about ways we might be able to assist a large group of people um, remotely, but we're we're still working through that. Um, in addition, we also partner with um, a few organizations to provide civics classes and workshops, and we do approximately 20 community-based events. So those things are what has been halted. 
from my understanding, some of the services have been completely halted from what you just said. Um, however, CUNY Citizenship Now is still providing these services remotely over the phone and by the web. What are some of the resources and services that people with immigration concerns can receive now remotely? Right now, we're still assisting with consultations over the phone, which we're doing consultations on all immigration matters. Um, we are doing remote application assistance for citizenship applications, um, TPS. DACA, and green card renewals. Technically speaking, we are open to assisting with other types of applications remotely. Um, however, due to the nature of those types of applications, we have found that most of the forms that we actually will be able to assist someone in completing um, remotely is actually going to be the ones I just mentioned. The way we do that is we do the consultation, we make sure they're eligible, we forward them all the forms and the data they need to provide us. We do the doc, we enter the data electronically, we email them a copy to make sure they confirm that everything is accurate. Um, and then, you know, we basically, under some circumstances, do electronic sig um, signatures. Otherwise, the person themselves um, receives it, signs it, and sends it out. So right now, the best way to contact us, and I'll be sharing those numbers with you later, is um, to call, text, or email. Um, calling and texting is better. If you call, you will you can leave you will very much be leaving a voicemail, and we'll contact you right back. The call center is accessing those um, voicemails and responding. In addition, if you send a text, we receive that too. We do not advise with email just because we are inundated with emails. And if you need an appointment, there is a specific phone number intended for that. Um, Stephanie, can you just tell us about some growing immigration concerns during COVID-19? Um, aside from the USCIS office being closed, I know um, plenty of people um, had concerns over you know, the closing of these offices and getting their naturalization. So a few things. One, because these offices are closed, even though you can still submit your naturalist, naturalization application, if your application is in the nature, is the type that requires certain types of supporting documentation, that may be difficult for you to do right now. So for example, if you have an arrest, um, but you're not, you know, you're still eligible to become a citizen and it's a minor issue, but it is in fact an arrest, you're going to have to submit a copy of the certificate of disposition. Because the courts are closed, unfortunately, you might not be able to get it right now. Um, it might. We are looking at ways to get those. It might be possible for some people, but um, we're still kind of testing that process. Um, so that's specifically for citizenship. Green cards are not as difficult to get the supporting documents, but for those who do not have the technology um, as easily accessible and who aren't as tech savvy, it's also going to be difficult because all of the immigration service providers are no longer providing in-service, um, in-person services. So the only way to really get any application done is if you have the, you know, if you're tech savvy enough so that you can do everything online. Um, I'm not sure if anyone is mailing out forms and asking people to complete them or mail them back, but I do think that might be a little bit nerve, um, dangerous right now. We have decided not to exchange paper <laughs> with people. And so um, in order to just stay as safe as humanly possible, um, that's just in regards to citizenship. Do you want me to go into the other types of applications and the complications, or do you want to focus on yes. citizenship? Yes, we should learn about the other applications as well, just in case, you know, viewers concerned about those others. Okay, so um, a couple of things that I think is important to keep in mind is right before COVID-19 pandemic um, happened, public charge rules changed. The new rules went into effect in February of 2020. And what that rule did is it made it um, more difficult for low income individuals to qualify for the green card. So you keep that in mind that as of February, the standards um, change and it you the government now requires more documentation. They also require higher income. They also require um, that people have stronger connections to their joint support. I'm sorry, to their um, to to the person who's providing a financial support. So a lot of the beneficiaries, i.e., the person who's applying for the green card, who may have had some income that would have you know helped the application look stronger because of COVID-19, may have lost um, their job. Consequently, they've lost that income, and so they, that might actually affect their ability to qualify for the green card. Um, that applies to anyone in the household who's losing any income, whose income would have been used to help the beneficiary get the green card. 
unfortunately, if somebody who is applying for a green card gets sick, my fear is that they might be afraid to go to um, the hospital out of concerns that, you know, they might be using Medicaid or maybe they're afraid that being exposed might be a problem. Um, if a petitioner becomes infected and passes away, depending on where the application is, that may have some negative effects. It also would have negative effects if the person who is the beneficiary is still abroad. Um, so if your you know, parent is applying to give you a green card and you're a young child and you're living abroad, it, you know, it complicates the matter and might, in some circumstances, um, make it impossible for you to actually come. If you're already here, it definitely complicates it, but you also have more options, thank goodness. Um, and the other part is that the beneficiaries who are stuck abroad, who already were either close to being approved or were approved when the borders were shut down, and whose family members may potentially now be sick in the US and who can't get to them. Um, so those are some of the, I think, the most common. There's a gazillion others that I'm sure I didn't mention, but I, I feel like these concerns might be um, some of the most common issues that we're going to see. Um, oh, one last thing. If somebody goes out of status right now, they're also in a very peculiar position. So let's say, you know, your TPS is, ex well, not TPS, but let's say your DACA is expiring and you're trying to renew it um, or you're going to be out of status for, let's say it, re it expired a while ago and your plan was to just apply for the green card. There's a rule that says if you don't have um, status, if you're undocumented for six months or more, depending on how you're getting the green card, it may make that process more difficult. And under some circumstances, you might no longer be eligible to get the green card in the US. Very complicated rule, but the bottom line is anybody who's losing status during this time, we're going to have to hope that the government takes to account the pandemic and allow them some kind of path, but we can't be sure as of now. Um, oh, one last thing, sorry. Interviews are not happening for the green card. So a lot of people who are undocumented and are waiting for the interview process, um, they're basically going to continue to remain in an undocumented state. And this is very scary as is. So considering being afraid of family getting ill, you getting ill, and now being worried that even though you have a path to the green card, you might not get access to it at a time that you feel like you need it the most um, is also an issue. And the last thing is asylum. Some applications are time sensitive. So let's say you come into the country, you have approximately a year to apply for asylum. If that year period happens during the pandemic, um, even though you can submit the form technically, the attorneys who would be able to assist you won't have access to you. And these forms are not the type of applications that a person can typically do on their own. So that's also a huge issue. Okay, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, that was a lot. No, no, that was um, very helpful information. And I really hope that, you know, there's help for these all these concerns that you brought up. Um, a lot of us didn't know about all of this. Um, can you also tell us about the free online civic classes for green card holders by the New York Historical Society in partnership with CUNY Citizenship now? Yes, um, some good news. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to discuss that, <laughs> uh, especially after all the grim stuff I've just shared with you. So the New York Historical Society um, is temporarily closed and they're not doing in-person classes like they used to do. However, they're, um, they've moved their classes to online. So they do it via video conferencing um, and the courses are still completely free for green card holders who are applying for citizenship. Um, I will share the details with you, but in essence, the website is www.newyorkhistory.org slash education slash citizenship project. There's also a couple of phone numbers. You can call either 311, but in addition, you can call them directly at 212-873-3400 extension 511. Do not try to memorize that. I will send it to you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> So before we go, Stephanie, can you just tell us about the importance of using this time and um, to get these services and resources at this time while we're on lockdown? Yes, this is crucial. So one of the things that um, CUNY Citizenship Now is trying to do is um, encourage people to submit the types of applications that they can now. Because when we go back to in-person services, we anticipate we're going to have to focus on a lot of time-sensitive applications. We're probably going to be helping people respond to a bunch of um, issues that arose during the pandemic. We'll probably be trying to assess how these closures of these courts affect the applications that were already pending. Um, 
sorry, especially the ones that we discussed who may be affected by um, the wait time. What that means is for a person who needs a citizenship or a green card renewal, it may take a really, really long time for you to get an appointment when we reopen. So since you could do it now, my, my um, advice is do it now. In addition, we're doing consultations, general consultations. So if you want to petition to give somebody a green card, you can still call us. We could still screen you. We could still tell you all of the documents and the forms you're going to need. And I assure you, it is a lot. I mean, a lot of supporting evidence. And it's going to take you a very long time to gather it. So what we're stressing people to do is to call us, get the consultation, find out what you need, spend this time going through your old boxes, calling friends, family, and cousins, and um, uncles and siblings who moved and trying to make sure that you get the documents you need from them, making sure that you have your identity documents, making sure that you look for your old passports, making sure that you gather your trips, making sure that you gather your old taxes, you order it from IRS online if you could do so. I mean, there's a gazillion forms that you're going to need to submit and um, supporting evidence, and it takes time to gather those. So if you're able to now, the suggestion is that you work on that so that when we reopen, you don't have to spend the time looking for something you could have done now. Right? Great advice. Um, and Stephanie, before we go, can you just tell us where people can go to find out more information? On Facebook, we're at Citizenship Now without the CUNY. Um, either way, you can call 646-664-9400 or you can text 929-334-3784. Thank you, Stephanie, for all the research and all the help and um, for being here today and joining us. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. If you need immigration resources and more information on CUNY Citizenship Now, please follow them on Instagram at CUNY Citizenship Now. OpenBXRX will be right back. It's been weeks since President Trump declared a national emergency in response to the spread of COVID-19. I am officially declaring a national emergency. Two very big words. In that time, we've seen the world as we know it shut down as we're forced to isolate ourselves. For some, isolation can be daunting, but something you can adjust to. But for others, like people with a history of substance and opioid use, isolation can mean life or death. If you're a drug user and you're isolated at home, you have several problems. One of them is you may go into drug withdrawal if you can't get your drugs. Dr. Samuel Friedman is a research professor at the NYU School of Medicine, Department of Population Health. He says isolation will drive some drug users to extreme lengths to prevent the side effects of withdrawal, which can ultimately expose them to the novel coronavirus. Some of them may end up getting arrested, in which case they're going to both be in withdrawal, and unless something's done to the jails and prisons, they're going to be in horrible risk for coronavirus because those things are going to be like nursing homes. Some of them already are. According to a 2018 study on rats published by the National Institute on Drug Abuse, when given the option to interact with other rats or ingest heroin or methamphetamine, quote, the rats consistently chose the social reward. Another concern for drug users besides isolation during COVID-19 is receiving adequate care. Dr. Friedman says some are homeless and are unable to gain access to clean syringes or naloxone in the event of an overdose because of a shortage of medical personnel. The more serious problem is all those people are, they have no protective equipment at the moment and they are burning out. The Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration released a statement urging many outpatient treatment centers to use telehealth and telephonic services. Mary Callahan, Senior Director of Outpatient Services for Odyssey House, says her treatment center, along with many others, are using telehealth in the interim to prescribe Suboxone, a drug which diminishes the effects of physical dependence to opioids, such as withdrawal symptoms and cravings. Someone who has previously been prescribed, and we can confirm the prescription online, so the doctor has the ability to do that, also already um, prescribed it, we are continuing to prescribe our patients. Callahan also suggests for drug users not to isolate yourself completely during this time. Instead, reach out to support hotlines such as theirs. Reporting for BronxNet, Darissa White. 
Welcome back to Open BXRX. Council member Fernando Cabrera recently announced that the Kingsbridge Armory is being used as an emergency food distribution center with the Get Food NYC program providing delivered food boxes to those in need. However, community groups have created a petition proposing that the 180,000 square foot space be used for much more. Joining us now to discuss the Open People's Armory petition for COVID-19 relief is member of the North Bronx Collective, Jay Espinosa. Thank you for joining us, Jay. Thank you for having me. So first, I just wanted to start about um, just learning about the North Bronx Collective and what you guys do. Can you just give us an opening about that? Sure. The North Bronx Collective is a group of residents living in North in the North Bronx area. And we are comprised of workers, uh, teachers, professors, uh, uh, organizers, and parents. And we basically are uh, pushing for things like universal health care, uh, universal food, universal housing. Uh, we support the campaign to cancel the rents uh, for tenants in, in New York State. And uh, we also believe in extending the eviction moratorium that is currently in place. Uh, we also believe in uh, freeing all those who are detained in the jails and in also the immigration detention centers. And now the North Bronx, the North Bronx Collective has created um, this petition to open up Kingbridge Armory for more services for the Bronx. Can we talk about why it's important that the Bronx get action now regarding COVID relief? So uh, right now the Bronx is considered uh, the least healthiest county in New York State. Uh, it's also considered one of the poorest, uh, if not the poorest counties in the country. Um, a lot of people believe, myself included, when the country has a cold, uh, the Bronx has the flu. Uh, and in this case, with the pandemic, uh, when the country has COVID-19, uh, the people of the Bronx die. So uh, as of yesterday night, the New York City Department of Health uh, uh, put out data showing that the highest death rate in the city right now for COVID-19 is 6% in the Bronx. The Bronx has the highest COVID-19 death rate in the city. Uh, that is almost twice as high as uh, Manhattan's death rate. And uh, there's a, also a headline that was put out recently uh, by uh, the city.com mm -hmm. that said that Bronx residents are twice as likely to die from COVID-19 in New York City. Um, the Bronx has the highest hospitalization rate right now of COVID-19, which is 32%. Um, and the Center uh, for Disease Control uh, also names several uh, diseases that puts people more at risk of getting COVID-19. So uh, I'll just name them throughout this, uh, the information that I will share with you. Uh, the Bronx is ground zero for asthma in the country. Asthma is one of those diseases that puts people more at risk of COVID-19. Um, the Bronx is also ground zero for diabetes in the, in the state of New York. Uh, the Bronx actually has the highest percentage of people with diabetes in the state at 16%. Uh, the Bronx is ground zero for mal malnutrition in the country, uh, has the highest rate of malnutrition in the country. Uh, and it is also a place where there are high rates of HIV, which also puts people more at risk of COVID-19. So the Bronx is basically... Uh, a place that is unfortunately notorious for tremendous health inequalities uh, that the current system we have uh, perpetuates. Right. And now, um, what are the petition demands when it comes to opening Kingsbridge Armory um, as a good location for this relief? So uh, the demands basically are, are five demands. Uh, so uh, we want a uh, hospital. Uh, with universal health care provided at the at the armory, we want uh, housing for the homeless, uh, prioritizing uh, disabled people, elderly folks, uh, trans folks, incarcerated and detained people, uh, survivors of domestic violence, undocumented people, um, mentally ill people, um, and also people who have asthma and are living in apartments with mold and pests. We want housing for those people. We want a mental health center also with universal health care. Uh, the grief that people are facing right now is unprecedented. And we need a safe haven for those who have mental illnesses and also for those who may be diagnosed after all this with new uh, mental illnesses. Uh, we want a food garden. 
Uh, while we uh, understand that the armory was recently opened as a temporary food distribution site, we we demand that we have a long-term sustainability plan for, for this area and particularly at the armory. So we believe a food garden will help us on that path. And we also demand that the state uh, hire every uh, folks that have been laid off due to the pandemic. We want those jobs to be paid uh, li living wages uh, with universal health care and also personal protective equipment to be provided uh, to those who have been unemployed uh, during this pandemic. Um, the Kingsbridge Armory is a ideal location for this because of the size. The size of it is basically the size of three football fields. Um, it is actually one of the largest armories in the world. So we believe that there's tremendous space and, and plenty of space uh, in order to build these uh, resources. Uh, it's been empty. The armory has been empty for 24 years uh, since 1996. And that is also a good reason for us to, to move in there with these resources. Um, the zip code where the Kingsbridge Armory is located, which is a zip code 10468, uh, currently has the highest percentage or one of the highest percentages of patients with COVID-19 in the city and also has one of the highest number of patients with COVID-19 in the city. Um, so these are the reasons why we believe the armory should be uh, utilized now and for the foreseeable future uh, for the people of this community and, and, and for the Bronx and for New York in general. Right. One thing I noticed from the demands in the petition is that a lot of what's being called for in, should be community controlled. Um, what is the importance that all of this is community controlled on behalf of um, North, North Bronx Collective? So community control is a concept that uh, I believe folks are not very familiar with. Uh, so I'll, I'll just kind of explain it as basically as I can. Uh, so community control is basically a, a democratic process in which the community directly manages resources uh, in their community, uh, not in the sense of uh, having a private company come in and manage those resources, but having the community directly uh, be involved in that. And you know, we have elected officials that are elected by the people and 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 do manage resources, but we want to decentralize that process, uh, and we believe in decentralizing it. Um, so we believe that community control is basically the community directly managing resources because we, we know how to keep us safe. Uh, we are experts of our community. We don't need experts to come into our community and tell us what we need. So we know best what we need. And so how do we uh, manifest the future in a community in which we can take care of ourselves? Um, the the Kingsbridge Armory is uh, scheduled to be redeveloped into the world's largest ice skating center. Uh, and that was an effort uh, won by the community uh, a couple years ago in 2013. However, the company that will come in to manage this, uh, this facility is a for-profit business, uh, the Kingsbridge National Ice Center. And so their main bottom line is profit. Uh, at the same time that they are gonna be managing this armory, there is going to be a, a, a community benefits agreement that will provide some some of the similar resources that we mentioned uh, in that project, but we don't believe it's enough. Uh, we, as a collective, believe uh, that this is a government crisis. The pandemic, the pandemic is a government crisis. It is not a COVID nineteen crisis. The government has the resources to provide enough supplies, enough food, enough housing, enough health care. And, and all of the things that we need to survive in this, in this pandemic and, and after the pandemic, the government has those resources. So we believe it's a matter of will. It's an issue of will and not an issue of, of, of ability. And so we believe this is a government crisis. And uh, recently, Governor Cuomo uh, put out a new budget which cuts uh, public services and empowers Wall Street. Uh, the recent budget he passed slashes Medicaid at $400 million to, to hospitals. It, it, cuts, it cuts Medicaid by $2.5 billion a year. And that includes $400 million cuts to hospitals. These are the same hospitals that we're depending on to, to, to save our lives from COVID-19. And at the same time that Cuomo is on TV proposing these new measures to maintain the crisis of COVID-19, 
he's cutting our our healthcare uh, system. He, he's cutting the the benefits that help us survive. So what does that do to people that are are left with nothing? We believe that this tactic is a tactic that empowers Wall Street. We believe that Governor Cuomo, by not acting in the interest of poor and working class people, is a tool of Wall Street. And so he needs to make a decision very quickly whether or not he get, he cares about our community. Because if not, then that means the community needs, needs to come in and take care of ourselves. Um, and so that's what we're pushing. We're pushing a program that is people before profits. And we believe the armory should be 100% publicly funded. We believe it should be 100% community controlled. And how that manifests practically is we envision uh, something like a advisory board or some kind of oversight committee uh, with members of different collectives of uh, community organizations uh, and institutions in the community that can give voice to, to this armory project. Um, in the redevelopment plans put forward by uh, the community with uh, the Kings Ridge National Ice Center, there is already a community space allotted to the community and there is already an advisory board, but that, uh, that space is only one third of the armory. And so we want to expand that to be 100%. We want that community space to be 100% of the army, not one third. And so that's how we, we, we believe community control can be uh, manifested in the army. Got it. Um, Jay, where and how can people see and join this petition that you are all putting out? Everybody can go to our Facebook page. We have a Facebook page. Uh, if everybody just types in North Bronx Collective, uh, they'll they'll find us right away. You can also type in facebook.com forward slash North Bronx Collective, and they should be able to find our petition on there on the Facebook page. Thank you so much for your time, JSB Noso, and thank you for joining us and sharing more about this petition to open the People's Armory. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Open BXRX. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Open BXRX. COVID-19 has impacted our daily lives. It has even changed the way we mourn. With the number of deaths increasing, funeral directors have faced many challenges and changes in procedures as they help families arrange services for their loved ones. Here to discuss is Jimmy Olson, spokesperson for the National Funeral Directors Association. Thank you for joining us today, Jimmy. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. One of the first things I want to learn about, of course, is um, the National Funeral Directors Association and funeral directors who are also on the front lines of this pandemic. Sure. The National Funeral Directors Association is the world's largest funeral organization. Um, their role there is to support and educate and advocate for funeral directors so that we have the tools necessary to help serve the families in our communities. And about just the um, funeral directors on the front lines of this pandemic, now I I can imagine the overwhelm uh, nowadays and how much how much things have changed from interpersonal contact to now remote work. How has that been going? Sure. It, it's so different all over the country, depending on where you're located. I'm located in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. We're a small rural 60,000 uh, member community. Um, it hasn't really impacted us yet. We've only had two deaths. Um, here in our county, um, we've only had 26 confirmed cases. I know that's nothing compared to New York City. Um, so even though I have worked with one of the two families that have passed away uh, here in our town, um, we're not seeing the, the things that we're seeing with, with others. Um, in New York, they are overwhelmed. There is such a, um, the sheer numbers are overwhelming. The ability to be able to um, have some sort of service, whether that's an immediate burial at the cemetery or if a family chooses to do cremation. Um, there is almost a seven to eight day waiting period prior to a cremation taking place because there is such a backlog for that. Um, 
I part of uh, another uh, member of our team has a funeral home in, in Hartford, Connecticut, and they are actually assisting doing cremations for uh, the medical examiner's office. Um, it's kind of all hands on deck right now. And the National Funeral Directors Association did put out a letter uh, to the governor um, asking for some sort of reciprocity with our licensing. So obviously each state has different licensing requirements, um, but most funeral homes or funeral directors obviously are licensed in their state. We've mobilized through the NFDA many members who are willing and able to travel and to volunteer. Unfortunately, right now they don't have any reciprocity with the state of New York. We've asked the governor um, to lighten that up, make an emergency rule that would allow licensed funeral directors in other states to be able to assist. Even, and again, for those funeral homes on the front line there, just to have the extra people to um, support their staff, let someone else take a break, um, give someone one night off, let them sleep in, just to be able to assist making um, what we call transfers, going to um, bring someone's loved one back into our care. Um, it could be so helpful to these funeral directors who are working 24 hours a day. And we hear about um, lack of PPE in the healthcare department. Is there also a lack when it comes to funeral directors? There is. Now, most funeral directors, um, have this in stock. So what what people may not understand with funeral directors is we use universal precautions with everyone. Many times we do not know what your loved one has died from. So we go in thinking the absolute worst case scenario, we're prepared for the worst. So every time we um, bring a loved one back into our care, we wear gloves, we wear masks, we wear face shields. When we're doing our preparations, um, you know, we wear uh, protective equipment. So we, a lot of funeral homes already have this. It's just part of our standard operation, operating procedures. Um, but yes, now, because we're using more and more of it, obviously with the sheer numbers that are there, we are running low. Um, the National Funeral Directors Association uh, with the CDC um, and the government actually petitioned for us to get us bumped up a little higher in the recognition um, so that we'd be on kind of in that same level as hospitals and, and a, um, emergency medical people, fire departments, police officers. Again, because we too have to go into these situations um, and we need the equipment also. And we did, we have been recognized as a kind of a primary, um, certainly one of those sustainable workers that we keep talking about. Absolutely. Um, Jimmy, can we discuss some of the new guidelines for funerals during COVID-19 um, when it comes to the limitations of funeral gatherings and what families should expect? Sure. The, um, the CDC, of course, has its recommendations. Now, each state is different. As we've seen, there are states that haven't even done any sort of safer at home sort of procedures. Um, here in Wisconsin, our governor did it early. Uh, we've been uh, kind of been shut down here in our state for over two weeks already. Um, so it's been very difficult for families to be able to have funerals. Things have gotten smaller. In our state, it is less than nine people. So it's nine or less allowed into a facility here in Wisconsin. Um, and that includes me. So now you have eight. Um, so that can be very difficult. Um, with our cemeteries, if we do do an outdoor service, such as a graveside service, we obviously have to still practice um, safe distancing, um, personal distancing. Um, and some of the cemeteries have put in requirements saying, again, 10 or less, maybe 20 or less, 30 or less. Um, but that's depending on the state, the city, and even the, um, the cemetery itself. So that limits the amount of people. So what does that leave for families? Um, some families have chosen, if funeral homes offer it, and most do, is video conferencing or, or playing the services online so that people can attend the service virtually. Most funeral homes have that capability to do that and are willing to do that. We don't charge for it. Um, it's just something that we're offering. The only issue I've seen is many people that are taking it on, it, it, it puts the family kind of in a difficult position is because then who actually does get to attend the funeral? Um, someone's gonna have to stay home and watch it online. So the families that we've offered it to here over the last couple of weeks have actually all declined it and decided to wait and do something later on simply because they didn't want to have to make that decision of who got to attend the service and who didn't. Um, and again, not want to put those families in that position. So um, the families we've served recently have been um, immediate burials where we've done outside services or mostly cremation where the family is now going to wait to have a memorial service and a celebration of life further on once we know what's happening. Wow. 
can imagine the hardships that both families and funeral directors are facing due to this. And um, I mean, in a way, I'm glad that these um, alternatives are being offered and that they're able to also wait it out because mourning our loved ones um, has been, you know, something that we've done for years and years. And this uh, pandemic has just completely changed that route. That must have been really understanding. They they understand. They know that this is what has to happen. Is it fair? Absolutely not. Are they frustrated? Absolutely, they are. They want to be able to celebrate their loved one and have that proper funeral, um, and they just can't. Um, so not only are they grieving, now they've got this new set of problems. Um, you know what to do, and it makes the funeral director puts us in a very vulnerable place too. And not only are we always there to serve and comfort the families. But unfortunately, now we're the bearer of bad news to tell them that they can't necessarily have the services that they would like for their loved ones. Jimmy, I also wanted to spend time speaking about the NFDA and Funeral Service Foundation COVID-19 Crisis Response Fund. Can we learn a little bit more about that? Certainly. So we have set up the um, through the, the foundation. The Funeral Service Foundation is our charitable arm or charitable giving of the National Funeral Directors Association. Um, they provide scholarships and, and grants and and monies for different educational opportunities, scholarships for continuing education. But we also have this where there is money being raised um, specifically for this to help funeral directors, to help families um, that are in need for this. They can, they can certainly you know, apply to the foundation for the assistance that they might need. Um, and also just, um, I think I wanna close out with just a message for families um, from a funeral director and um, how uh, funeral directors are currently helping families cope through all of this and while providing critical service on the front lines. Sure, uh, the funeral director is still there for you, um, like we always are. Um, we're still serving families who aren't affected by this by COVID right now. So this, this is business as usual for us. Again, we've seen sheer numbers go up, um, but we still have to take care of our own. We still take care of you. We are still there for you. Um, and if you have any questions, certainly please reach out to your funeral director. They have the answers. They have the tools. The National Funeral Directors Association daily gives us updates of how to best serve families, uh, best practices, and many opportunities for alternatives. So again, through the foundation or our uh, the website for consumers for a life worth celebrating uh, com, there are many options to suggestions that you can do instead of attending the service, whether that be sending uh, email condolences or writing letters, um, sending photos, making videos, um, things to help celebrate outside of what we would consider maybe more traditional instead of just showing up at a visitation and paying your respects um, in person, you know, still doing what we're doing here, having a video conference with those families. Those families still need that connection. So still continue to reach out to them and let them know that you are there for them also, but obviously have to do it from a safe distance. So again, many opportunities for suggestions, um, both through the NFDA and for through the Funeral Service Foundation. A beautiful message. And thank you so much for your time, Jimmy Olson from the NFDA, the National Funeral Directors Association. You're very welcome. Have a great day. You as well. That's all for our show today. Thank you for tuning in to BXRX. I am your host, Sanji Lopez, wishing you and your family safety and wellness now and always. Until next time. Who's most at risk for coronavirus? People over 65, people with underlying medical conditions like heart disease, chronic lung disease, asthma, diabetes, people undergoing cancer treatment, and people with weakened immune systems. What should you do if you or a loved one is at higher risk? Avoid close contact with people. Avoid crowds. Stay home if you can. Wash your hands frequently. Learn more ways to protect yourself and others at coronavirus.gov. Why should young people care about the spread of coronavirus? Well, we know that people with underlying medical conditions over the age of 60 are at highest risk, but they've got to get it from somebody. So we're asking everyone to be selfless for others so that we can protect those who are most susceptible. Not going to bars, not going to restaurants. It all just means physical separation so that you have a space between you and others. For more information on how you can social distance, please go to coronavirus.gov.
Al tomar transporte público, no toques su teléfono. Lleve desinfectante para sus manos y úselo inmediatamente al salir del autobús o tren. No te toques la cara. Si alguien tose o estornuda, aléjase. Lávese las manos con agua y jabón lo antes posible. Limite el contacto con los postes. Si es posible, evite las horas pico. No comas ni bebas en transporte público. Mantenga su bolsa del piso o otras superficies. Evite tocar directamente los torniquetes. Manténgase al día con lo último de su departamento de salud local y el CDC.